Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest with us. She's a certified nutritionist, and her name is Amy Fox, and she focuses on helping people uh, change their mindset and the way they feel, uh, all by using the right foods and by putting the right nutrition into our bodies. We could change the way we feel, the way we think, the way we act. It just, you know, it's it's amazing what food could do to the body. So in a minute, I, before we start, I just want to say thank you and just ha put a shout out to DMA World. It's a it's an organization. It's a consultant organization that works to help people, you know, small businesses not get scammed by the big biggest the big business marketing companies that try to take your money and not really give you the help you deserve. So DMA World really helps the small businesses become really advance themselves into a different level. And they also have a program that they wanted me to mention. It's going to be 30waystomarket.com and they're doing a seminar and everybody is invited to go, just go on, log on to register and you can go on to this uh, seminar where they will be having soon uh, to learn 30 different strategies on how to improve your business and how to improve your marketing. So let's go back to the person that we is the star of our show. So Amy, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Yeah, you got it. And thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, I'm excited to just have an opportunity for us to have a chat and uh, to reach your listeners. So um, I just appreciate the time today and, and the opportunity. Um, so I am the founder of a company called Food and Mood, and I've been in the consulting space and the entrepreneur space for a long time. And um, I have been super passionate about nutrition, fitness, you know, healthy mindsets for decades. And a few years ago, I decided to formalize that. And I got my degree in uh, nutrition and food science and a few other certifications because I am just on a mission to help people understand how to use nutrition to feel good, because I'm a big believer that when you're feeling good, I mean, the opportunities are endless. You've got hope and you've got possibility. Um, I'm sure we've all been there when even when we have a little tickle in the back of our throat or uh, we're on vacation and we've got, you know, maybe a little cold starting, you know, it starts to put a damper on things. And you know, as we age and we want to, you know, it's it's the perfect time to start to think about what investments can I make about um, how I'm fueling my my body so that I'm here and I'm thriving. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm I've been uh, focused on helping to educate people and sharing information and recipes and writing for some publications uh, just to help people simplify it and get to the bottom of what some of the key ways we can adopt healthy habits. So um, I'm super excited about the opportunity to do that. You know, so many people don't realize, um, you know, we live in a go-go society, as we were talking about before, and especially moms or people who have jobs, you know, they come home, they have a family to cook for. Sometimes people will, you know, bring home food or they'll just buy quick food that's easy to make that, you know, because they're already tired and they don't have the time to prepare. But, you know, explain to people the importance of what ingredients go in your body and how it could play a big role on how you think, how you're feeling feel, your, your whole mindset and body, how food affects your body. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I get it. I am that person juggling a lot, like almost everyone out there. So, um, and sometimes, you know, that's what we need to do to put food on the table and, uh, and make sure that our families are nourished. And that's really the question, isn't it? I mean, um, when we're reaching for those options, um, are they really, uh, providing the energy and the nourishment that um, is best for us to help us and help our family show up in the ways we really want to. And, you know, unfortunately, the reality is most of the options that we may grab on the in the middle of the grocery store or through a drive through, um, they're filled with chemicals and processed ingredients that really take the nutrients out of that food. So a lot of times they're empty calories and they include um, they include ingredients that uh, can really work against us. And what I mean by that is when we're reaching for foods that are highly processed or in the in the nutrition space, they're called ultra processed foods. 
So just to be clear for the audience, like those are foods that very simple. If you buy them in a box or a bag and you look on the back, you see ingredients, more than one or two ingredients, a long list of ingredients. And so that's a lot of food that we're probably all eating. And when we start to eat those foods, um, they are um, usually they have a lot of sodium and sodium, anything box or bags typically to, to make those foods shelf stable, there's right. usually chemicals in them to make them like last. If you look at the expiration date, do you ever wonder why like these foods can last <laughs> months, if not years? So, yeah. um, so those like, it, and it oftentimes includes sodium and just other ingredients that aren't necessarily helping to keep us full, helping to keep us, um, help us to, speaking of children, that's one of mine, the one at college I was telling you about yeah. asking me what he should get at the grocery store, believe it or not. So, um, but yeah, those, so we want to be thoughtful about having foods that are closer to the whole source. So they're just whole foods. And when we're out at restaurants or we're going through drive throughs those are foods that um, are either cooked in oil, they have added ingredients, and they're just not good for us. And there's a some research that I had mentioned to you that actually just was um, shared just a, a few weeks ago. One more study that is showing that ultra processed foods are linked to depression. And I mean, we, there have been hundreds of studies about ultra processed foods and the association with symptoms of chronic diseases and linked to an increase of certain chronic diseases. And so those, those studies have been out for some time and, but now more and more research is coming out that shows that food, ultra processed foods, especially those sugary drinks and foods that have a lot of added sugars and artificial sugars, that it's linked to depression. And yeah. that's one particular study really uh, focused on women and um, those are the artificial sugars. So a lot more to be learned, but there just continues to be this body of evidence that supports processed foods. My apologies. Um, sorry about that. Um, so the, the processed foods that that just he's not getting the point. My apologies. That's okay. Anyway, so not good for us. So we have to be thoughtful about um, about that because research is still is is still being shared. But there's a there's a there's a really strong link between um, certainly chronic diseases and depression. Yeah, you know, people don't realize, but you know, I always say if you look on the back of the ingredients, if you can't say it, then obviously it's not good for you. You know, right. and, uh, yeah. And it makes it so confusing for anyone out there. And I think it's even more and more confusing because of the access we have to information, um, the internet certainly, and just social media. I mean, if you look at, because we're saying these words out loud, I'm sure if we go to our phones, we'll have some information that's being shared with us and almost... Um, you know, almost everyone out there has some research or something that's backed by science that has us thinking we should eat meat, not eat meat. Oh, that's one example. And so it, it's just, it's a, it's a confusing time. And to be, um, you know, really, that that's really one of the reasons why I wanted to start the Food and Mood Lab, um, just yeah. because I was inspired by um, stories and uh, motivated to start to simplify the information, sort of break through the noise. Right. Um, my mom was a big influence in my interest in nutrition. She um, struggled with type one diabetes uh, for over sixty five years, and she passed a few years ago. And I mean, I can't tell you how many nutritionists or doctors that she met with that would try to explain the way they wanted her to eat. And you know, she was part of an older generation and just, it, it was still, it always um, escaped her. Just this, just understanding how to apply it to her situation and her lifestyle. And so I just always saw her struggling to figure out, you know, how do I handle a low or a high? And, um, and so that 
was one of the reasons that just inspired me to just um, get my degree and find ways to help uh, make it simple and easy, practical. Because like we started in our conversation, I mean, there's, it's a demanding world out there. Yeah. We're probably challenged to carve out time to um, be healthy, whether that's nutrition, exercise, having a kind of a healthy mindset. It's hard to find the time, I think, for any, for everyone these days. Right. You know, and and a lot, it's a lot of times you see in our society, you see that when people in, in, are eating foods, you know, a lot of our society is overweight. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I noticed when I went to Europe is that a lot of the food was homegrown and it was fresh and it came from the backyards and it was just, you only had to eat a small portion to be full. Where yes. when you to, you know, our, our society, when the foods are processed, you see people eating large quantities of foods and they're not fe like feeling that full feeling yes. because it doesn't resonate in our digestive system the way it does, you know, compared to fresh foods. Uh, maybe you can go into de detail and explain to people why, you know, um, you know, when you, when you eat fresh food, there is a completely different feeling in your body and your body reacts completely different when you eat versus the, the processed foods. Yeah. And I, I completely agree with you. And you're talking to someone who I had, I was fortunate enough to go to Italy not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And I had that same experience. I mean, I, I mean, I had the opportunity to eat, um, eat out a lot, but they were always, always mostly with fresh ingredients. And I think the, you know, sort of the, the bottom line is when you have food and closer to its whole source, meaning right. if you're going to have vegetables, you're having vegetables that are either picked from a garden or bought at a grocery store or a farm stand, and you're cooking those and keeping them and, and they're closest to whole source. Um, and so a couple of things that it might be helpful for people to understand when you start to eat foods that become processed and to some degree, every food is processed, but right. more ingredients we're adding or we're, as we're repurposing those foods, like canned, jarred, boxed foods, yeah. I would challenge your listeners to look at the box and look at the fiber content. Mm -hmm. And so it's, to me, it's really about it's really about fiber um, because when we're having when we have fiber in our diets, and that's all it's usually a um, a struggle for most Americans to get the daily requirements for fiber. And most women and men, it's somewhere around twenty five to thirty five grams of fiber on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And that's when you're having fast food, you generally have no fiber. You're eating nuggets and fries. Um, right. so you find fiber in fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And even with the grains, you kind of have to be careful. Some people yes. think about pasta. Oh, that has fiber. But if you start to pay attention to the label and just start to invest a little time in, in really seeking out how you're fueling your body, pay attention yeah. to two areas. So we're looking at the fiber intake, the fiber in that serving just yeah. the serving, not what you want to eat, but what the serving says. And then right. we're also looking at added sugars. So right. that feeling good, um, that that feeling that you mentioned, to me, a lot of times comes from for one, one way is through having foods that actually fill you up. When you're having foods with fiber, you're going to feel full, more full. Right. And you're also going to be putting more um, good bacteria in your body. And so the fiber is your friend when it comes to gut health. And right. gut health is linked, having a good uh, gut microbiome with a diverse bacteria, you are going to set yourself on a path uh, to longevity, to feeling good and a host of other benefits. So fiber is your friend. And when we talk about having those meals uh, when we were traveling and having foods that are closer to the whole source, that's generally, that's probably one of the reasons why. So right. fiber is one of those, um, one of those reasons. And we just also just want to be careful about um, how much added sugar we're having in our diets. Um, and there's um, certainly natural sugars that I'm not talking about, but it's the, it's the sugar that is literally added to foods Yes. So that it gives you that high, much like other substances, you get a high your blood because your blood sugar is on the rise. And sometimes it's a pretty, um, 
pretty uh, immediate spike. And right. that uh, is not only what feel good feels good temporarily, it gets us hooked. But unfortunately, yeah. um, we have a we have a crash after that, and that um, makes us feel tired and cranky, and yeah. it just sets us also on this trajectory of having blood sugar, um, irregular blood sugars, and over a long time, if that's happening, it just leads to uh, negative health implications. Everything from type two diabetes to um, just uh, perhaps other things as well. Right. And I, you know, we, we had talked about this and I know you had mentioned it about, you know, mood swings and insomnia. You know, one of the biggest things that our society suffers from is insomnia. If you look at articles, people are so interested in how to get a good night's sleep because they can't. And a lot of people don't realize that it could be the foods that you're, you're putting into yeah. your body. And, you know, and it, it's so important to get good sleep because a lot of times illnesses can form you know, when we don't get enough of sleep. And maybe you can talk a little about the importance of, you know, good foods and maybe some of the foods people should maybe stay away from or eat more of that could help with insomnia and, and other sleep problems that they're experiencing. Sure. And I mean, it definitely is a hot topic because we all struggle from it. Like I had a bad night's sleep last night. I'm going to blame it on my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, and I thought I was doing all the right things. So it happens, but I definitely think it's important to underscore that if you think of your health as a house, like sleep is the foundation with, if, if you have poor sleep, you aren't going to feel good. I mean, we can all probably handle a night, maybe even right. two of not a, not a lot of sleep or good quality sleep, but right. It, it really, most people don't understand that sleep not only um, certainly can make you cranky and tired, but it starts to mess with your hormones and right. it starts to lead to other problems that could affect weight um, and many other things. So it truly is the foundation, but it's tricky. I mean, there's a lot of things. Uh, it is definitely not one dimensional. So you sort of need to have all of your, all of the switches flipped if you can, you know, so there's certainly, we get, we'll get to food, but there's also just some of the things that you want to be aware of. So you don't have the deck stacked against you uh, right. because you can do all the best things about food. But if you are on your phone or I have a screen, whether that be, be TV or what have you a few hours before bedtime, it can keep your brain fired up and not, uh, and not calming your nervous system. So some of the things I'm sure your listeners have always heard about, and you know that's not a that's not a new thing, but just as a reminder because it's it can sneak up on you. I did it last night. Somebody texted me. I grabbed my phone and I got stuck in a texting thing. So it's just it's so easy to grab our phones. So thinking about maybe literally putting them out of the room if you can. Yeah. But and just things like you want to have people talk about teas, right? Having a sleepy time tea. Well, I don't know if anybody's like me, if I have a cup of tea before I go to bed, guess what's happening a few hours later? I'm getting up. <laughs> so <laughs> just, just like you've got, to, even though that's a great idea, we want to be thoughtful about if you're someone like me, I have a very small bladder and it wakes wow. me up. So um, I, I'm not going to have a, a cup of tea right before I go to bed, maybe a little, a little earlier, or I just think of other things. So just, just a few things that are important to just be aware of that we that also play a, a factor in getting good sleep. But before we go into some of the foods, there's definitely other aspects about like nutrition that go into sleep. For example, uh, if you're making dinner late at night and it's a heavy meal, when we're sleeping, our body is is trying to restore and repair all of our systems and our body functions. Mm -hmm. If you're having a big heavy meal, especially with foods that are harder to break down or um, highly processed foods, your yeah. body has to prioritize that first. You're probably not going to have as restful of a sleep, or you might have, you might not feel as good at night going to bed with a heavy meal. So the timing of your meals is actually a, a pretty important thing. So um, maybe just wrapping up dinner um, several hours, four to five hours before you eat. So that's a, an important one to think about. And, um, you know, if a lot of times, unfortunately, people think that a glass of wine or a 
little sip of bourbon might help with sleep. And it might initially help you to fall asleep, but um, our body's an amazing thing and it loves to be in balance. And so both of alcohol is a toxin. We all know that. But yeah. when you have um, some alcohol before bedtime and even it can even be one glass, it doesn't have to be a bottle. Your body has to get rid of the toxins first. Mm -hmm. So as it starts to do that, it's also bringing your ba brain back in balance. And okay. so to counteract the artificial dopamine that gets released from the brain. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, there's some stress hormones are released. So yeah. Anyone listening has ever woken up in the middle of the night and felt that mind racing symptom or had worry or anxiety? It isn't you. It's it's the alcohol um, and your brain getting back in balance. Um, and it's that process happening. So, uh, but it's a myth that wine or a glass of wine will help you to relax. It for 10 or 15 minutes, it might, but then there's the payback if you're trying to go to sleep. So but I just make sure we're, we're stacking the deck in favor of us getting good quality sleep. And yeah, there's definitely some foods that naturally have like melatonin, um, like tart cherries or nuts. The nut family is a really great snack and almond or even pumpkin seeds. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a snack on my website. It's meant, it's a stress and sleep snack and it's yummy. It's got a, some nut mixture with a little bit of dark chocolate mixed on it like uh, that. that you just like pick out a little of that. It's got some, all of those ingredients have some natural compounds that help to promote um, some good sleep quality. There's uh, omega-3 omega -3 fatty acids. So having some fish, um, bananas, um, foods like that can again yeah. help you. Um, but we just have to look kind of multi-dimensional, like, like 360. Are we doing all the other things as well? Right. Now, as we get older, our melatonin, we start to produce less of it. And sometimes that's one of the causes why we have trouble sleeping. Is there anything that you suggest that people can do as they get older and they're producing less melatonin in their body? Yeah, take it. We can take some melatonin uh, tablets and just experiment with a low dose. It's a mm -hmm. not, it's not addictive, which is, uh, you know, I, I use it every night. And, um, and sometimes I, I'm the type of person that, I may not have trouble falling asleep, but I wake up in the middle of the night. So right. I may, I usually have um, a, a small tablet near my bed if I wake up. Um, Cause that's sometimes that that's my, that's my sleep patterns. And if I, even if I get up just a little bit, my, right. my mind wakes up. Oh boy. I mean, I'm off in a million directions. I'm planning the day. I'm, the, <laughs> I'm doing everything that you shouldn't be doing. So sometimes even just the middle of the night, um, if that happens, and then certainly like a, a good magnesium supplement um, is uh, just can be a, a magic bullet too that can help you to to fall asleep. So there's some really great supplements on the market that are um, just good for you overall. Right. Yeah. Isn't um, uh, magnesium and potassium a good combination for yes. getting? Yeah, they just work in harmony with each other, and. Um, you know, you can get like if you're taking an, a multivitamin, you should be getting enough of the potassium. Um, I just find that the extra magnesium is what, or you know, you know, getting the potassium-rich fruits and vegetables into your diet, um, right. like broccoli as a as an example, or you know, certainly bananas. We know have good potassium levels as well. So people really should stick more towards the green and the healthier natural foods. You know, if they really want to change their diet and, and improve their bodies and their and balance their hormones and be able to balance their moods and their energy levels, it's really about really focusing more on the natural foods and, you know, staying away from those processed foods and really, you know, creating a, a lifestyle that is going to be, you know, beneficial for them. Yeah. And I like to help people think of simple, practical strategies to make that happen. Um, because people who may not be used, I'm working with a client who eats, she thought she was eating super healthy. When we really broke her diet down, she um, was eating, she wasn't eating enough protein, which is a whole nother conversation. But we look at fruits and vegetables, uh, the type, she was eating a salad primarily with just um, 
like romaine lettuce. And so to her, that was healthy, but with cucumbers. So we had to just think about how do we add a little more diversity of fruits and vegetables into the diet? And um, one of the ways that I like to just uh, encourage people to start is um, grab your favorite um, leaf, green, green leaf. It could be kale or spinach, um, arugula. And I just encourage her to add a ha handful one to two times a day. And just so, cause some people aren't used to eating, um, spinach, let's say, and as an example, or kale, and it can have a texture that unless yeah. you're used to eating it, you may not, it may not be as enjoyable and we want food to be enjoyable, right? Like this is a food's awesome. We need a, a food that make, that we love to eat, but you can blend it, bury it in things, bake it. You know, there's a, uh, a lot of different ways you can just add it and, that's a really great starting place. And there's so many um, nutrients that you're getting just by adding in some of those leafy greens and it starts to really help your gut, which uh, really is affects everything. So yeah, very true. Now, if you had to give some strategies, you know, maybe some healthy suggestions for maybe breakfast or lunch or for dinner, do you have anything that you could tell someone that doesn't really know a lot about nutrition or maybe they know about nutrition, but they're not really sure what they should do? Maybe yeah. you can suggestions? Yeah, sure. So I think we want to be thinking about um, having protein, good protein sources, and I can share some ideas at every meal and snack, especially breakfast. And I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir, but um, the reason why we want to eat protein is a, there's a long list of reasons. But if we're just speaking generally, when we're right. eating protein and we're having carbs with protein and even some healthy fats, we have this like symphony of wonderful things that are happening, but it's going to give us lasting energy. And right. we're only having carbs and, or, or, you know, only having carbs and we're not pairing it with protein. That's when we get this, uh, these blood sugar spikes, which mm -hmm. inevitably make, can lead us to feeling like less energy, maybe hungry later on. And so when people start to think about how do I incorporate protein in every meal and they start to do that, what they find is that they feel satiated, right. like their energy is long lasting. They snack less. So a lot of people lose weight. It's pretty hard to um, overeat protein. Um, yeah. And so you just feel, you feel satisfied. And so for example, in the morning, um, yogurts are a great thing to incorporate. And um, you just want to be careful that when you're eating yogurt, we want right. to look at the back of that label and make sure we have um, very few added sugars, if none. And there are some great brands like Oikos Triple uh, Zero, that Greek yogurt. Um, but that's what we have to be careful about. But there's some really right. good options out in the market. We're eating eggs and don't be afraid of the whole egg, but maybe an egg with some egg whites. Um or even incorporating some protein powders. Um, we're adding like lean chicken or some turkey or some organic um, meat uh, to every meal. So it's it's actually not too difficult, but just gotta be intentional about making sure that we're getting protein because it's um, not only gonna help us to have good energy, feel full and satiated, but um, people who are 40 and over, we gotta fight for all the muscle to keep all that muscle in our body. So eating protein, um, is good to help to, for muscle repair and right. many other, many other things. So, um, I, that's probably one of my starting places with most people is to just take inventory. How are you eating? Are you getting, you know, your ideal body weight, um, in grams of protein on a daily basis as a starting place? Right. Um, so that's usually our starting uh, where, where we go first. Right. I know there's so many women, especially in their mid forties and fifties, they're trying to lose weight, but their weight has plateaued and their metabolism has slowed down and they struggle to try to lose the weight. Absolutely. Is there any suggestions that you might have for people who are at middle age that are struggling with trying to lose weight? hundred percent. I'm so passionate about this topic because um, it'll be a, actually I'm launching a course uh, at the end of the year around um, mastering your mood and balancing hormones because it's such an issue. Most people you know, start into menopause. It's the perimenopause phase early in their forties. They don't even know it. It can last right. 10 years. It's so different for everybody, but, yeah. um, you know, menopause is like a full contact sport. I mean, it's literally can be, it can affect 
all all aspects of our well being. And so, but when you're struggling to lose weight, and you may be it, at some phase of the the menopause journey, um, it's a lot of what we've been talking about. But we're going to really shine a light on a few different strategies and really shore up that protein as an example. When, um, and let me just take a step back. Sometimes what's happening when women struggle to lose weight, when they're middle-aged, 40 plus, um, you know, the body's starting to produce less estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And wow. that starts to wreak havoc on our bodies. And a lot of times there's an increase in cortisol. And those are some of the, those hormonal imbalances that start to keep weight on our stomach or just make it harder to lose weight. Yeah. So um, for women that are are in that space, I think um, a few things, if we've got, uh, if we're dealing with sort of increase in cortisol, which is typically happening, we have to manage our stress. And when we feel stress, we have to move more. So, right. um, and it's the non-intentional movement. So getting up behind the desk and just not being sedentary. So someone that I gauge who is moving a lot outside of the, again, the planned exercise, they're getting five to 7,000 steps a day, just walking around in life, moving around in life. Right. Um, so you want to be moving more. And, and when we are choosing to exercise, it's that resistance training. That'll yeah. be really key and adding, just adding some weights. That's so important because we're going to, that will help to sort of unlock uh, some of the resistance and we're going to look to literally build more lean body mass. Right. So, um, and many of the other reasons I found is sometimes related to gut issues. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of things we've talked about adding in the leafy greens, um, thinking about, um, some supplements, perhaps some probiotics or prebiotics right. and, um, yeah, just being really thoughtful about removing or limiting those ultra processed foods. We've got to have a healthy gut. If, yeah. if we start to sleep in that house analogy and we're starting to put the framing up, the guts, the frame, we've got to have a good gut. Uh, that's really, um, allows everything else to work, work right. And, um, and our bodies to, to be super functional. Right now, a lot of times when, you know, um, we, when the people eat salads, they tend to, like you said, they use the romaine lattice, but that has no nutrients in it. So what would you suggest for, for different types of healthy salads? What would be a healthy salad in, in your perspective? So I too love the romaine because it's crisp, but I just add, I'll add a handful, I'll get the darker leafy greens. So literally just scan the, the, uh, the produce section. It could be Swiss chard. It could be, there's some mixed microgreens that are out there. Um, then there's, um, uh, yeah, the spinach and the kale, just anything that's dark and leafy. So just go right. by color, go by your eye and see what's fresh or what's on sale. Um, yeah. and that's a, that's a great way, you know, great way to do it. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's some simple hacks too. If I don't have fresh produce on hand, mm -hmm. I make sure that I have frozen vegetables in the freezer. And mm -hmm. I mean, if I can't get, um, if I can't find the greens to make a salad just last night, I, I found myself in that situation. So I popped, um, some frozen broccoli into the microwave, and a trick that I love is because frozen broccoli is a quick way. It's inexpensive. It's, I mean, almost if not as good as buying it at the grocery mm -hmm. store. And some people would argue that it's better because it's frozen right after it's been harvested, right. not mm -hmm. transported uh, to the grocery store. So, right. but I don't know about you, but when I take any frozen vegetable out of the microwave, it's really, really wet and soggy. Yeah. So uh, I'd pop it in the air fryer <laughs> or... <laughs> Throw it That's in a, a high, idea. yeah. It, like you it. just have a it, crispy in minutes. Um, I was lazy and I didn't even want to bring out my air fryer, so I'd put a skillet on, put a little uh -huh. oil, and I just basically charred the broccoli. But it was awesome. It was like just a different way to have it. I like a, I like a little little bit of a firmer texture. But um, you just look in a and. That's just, you know, that's an easy way. The, the um, riced cauliflower options are super awesome. Yeah. Uh, so the frozen section of your grocery store can be your friend and help you to have like kind of a easy, no excuses 
to why I can't have some vegetables in the day. And um, you just want to be thoughtful about that label again and just make sure that there's, the aisle now is so big and mm -hmm. they have um, some vegetables and seasoning and those um, we don't want because that again starts to bring in a more processed type of food. Just look for the plain frozen vegetables that you like and have them on hand in the freezer. Exactly. I agree hundred percent. And you know, when people have a high cortisol level, a lot of times, even when they are, you know, uh, especially when they're going through perimenopause or menopause, you know, it's very hard for them to lower that cortisol level, even when they're trying to do, you know, they're trying to get the movement in and, you know, are there other suggestions that you would suggest there is meditation good, or is there certain types of foods? Like if there are people are that, that are suffering from high cortisol, they're trying different ways to get it lowered, but they seem to be struggling with that. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so I think a few of them. So a hundred meditation is fantastic. And again, you're speaking to somebody who needs to do more of it. But I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you don't have to be in a certain place or have like even just some simple breathing techniques that right. might allow you just to calm your nervous system. That's what we're trying to do. When we can calm our nervous system, it should help to reduce or lower cortisol levels. So it could be, I try to like stack habits around, like, so sometimes if you're gonna go get the mail or you're gonna get a glass of water, like right. step outside, grab a, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to do this for 15, 20 minutes. Sure, you could work up to that, but even yeah. just some simple breathing techniques and you can make it up on your own or find there's a, there are hundreds of free meditations on YouTube and elsewhere, but yeah. you can just build it into the routine that works for you. But the key for reducing those cortisol levels is to try to calm your nervous system. And it's a real thing, especially going through perimenopause and menopause. Like it's like, that is a real thing. And just, it's not you, it's, it's just how our hormones are, are just are out of balance. And so finding and, and really being intentional about that and other self-care. So for example, like baths are a really good way to do that. Like the lavender baths yeah. with Epsom salts and just creating some traditions that allow you to get a minute just to breathe. So right. whatever, you know, that, that's, that looks so differently to everybody, but there's I mean, gobs of research that really back meditation and stress reduction. And, you know, I think that it goes back to kind of sort of close the loop on some of our other conversations. There's like, there are these, there, there are a lot of studies now that show when we eat bad foods. And when I tell you we eat bad foods, this latest research shows that you don't have to eat a lot of crappy food for it to really start to matter. In fact, it's really about 20% of a person's calorie uh, calories during a day. And that's like, that to me, we need a sh a, to shine a light on that because some people think it's not them. Oh, I just have a, a little bit. It, it is only a little bit that starts to impact the symptoms of depression and anxiety. So yes. it does come back to that. D depression and anxiety are closely linked. And so a lot of times that's why then our cortisol levels are, are on the rise because we're feeling symptoms of anxiety and stress. So foods that make us feel good are everything that we've been talking about. And I do have a lot on my website to help people start to make that shift or start to understand what that really means. But um, it starts with a lot of what we we talked about. And it could be as simple as choosing to swap, make one swap of anything that's boxed or bagged with yeah. a whole food. It just one meal, just try it like one meal a day instead of the bag of pretzels, which you think are healthy, but they have really no nutritional value. You have an apple. Exactly. You have a piece of fruit. Right. Exactly. I know for me, like I, I started going through perimenopause at 39. I didn't even know what was happening. And, um, you know, how do you feel about going to a functional medicine doctor for like blood work, at least to figure out what hormones might be low and what's going on with your body and what deficiencies you might have? I, I, I really encourage that because um, hormone replacement therapy or natural um, remedies, depending on who you're talking to, uh, are, are a wonderful path to explore. So, and I would say that 
and some overall lifestyle changes are really important. And if you're, you decide to use some hormone replacement therapy, it can be a life changer and to get the full benefit of that, because just because you're taking some hormones, your cells have to be open to receiving them and then your cells have to use them. And so you're definitely um, helping when you start to, if you're, if you do have some issues and it's recommended that you start some hormone replacement therapy. Um, but you also have to be thinking about how do you get the most value out of that? And that comes down to the things you've been talking about, moving your body, making the right choices about how you're fueling your body. So, um, doing some resistance training and moving all of that is, is related. And I talk to some women sometimes that thinks that they, they check the box. If they've yeah. seen their doctor and they've chosen a route for um, different therapies, but it's really, it's truly, you know, holistic to get the full benefit of it and really to see the changes like reduced body, um, belly fat and weight loss. Yeah. We've got to be, we've got to pull it, be pulling all over all those levers or switches. Right. And I think like, you know, like you mentioned, I think it's, it's a, it's a blend. It's a cocktail of, of a life change. You know, you can't, a lot of people think, okay, if I go and I, I take, you know, I take my hormones and I, you know, live life accordingly to the way I'm used to things are going to change, but it really is a lifestyle change. You have to, you know, you have to change the way you live, the way you sleep, the way you're eating, you know, you know, incorporating maybe some exercise or, you know, doing things, relaxation techniques, you know, to, to help the body. I think it's really, you know, a whole combination of things that really help a person get the ultimate effect. Do you feel the same way? I, I agree. I mean, I mean, I'm not I only not agree, but I'm trying to really uh, zone in on that for my my work because I'm so passionate about it. I mean, it's there's a uh, there's a lot there's a lot we can do to help people understand how to pe- put all the pieces together. And like we've talked about, it's so individualized. Like you might be yeah. experiencing different symptoms than me and more, more than likely, or the degree of them yeah. and your lifestyle. I'm sure everyone's lifestyle is different and what, um, you know, what we have space and how we need to adapt some of these practices um, yeah. in the flow um, of, of other day-to-day responsibilities we have. So yeah. And I mean, I think, I think I read something, there's like 6,000 women a day enter menopause and there's just not enough, there's information, but helping people to understand how to really translate it, to activate it into a practice that works for them is where I see a really, really big opportunity because women are suffering. I mean, oh, yeah. I'm sure you've seen the same statistics I have. Um, women in the age between the ages of 45 and 54, that represents the highest suicide rate. Can you believe that? Oh, like that's wow. I mean, like, isn't that is just so I am I feel very called to um this particular topic because it's when you break it down, it's really a lot of the other healthy habits we've been talking about, but it's helping helping to make sense of it for uh, for a woman at a given time in her life. No, that's so important. You know, and I think from a lot of women that I've spoken to, they don't realize that they have a choice. They think, okay, I'm going through it and that's it, you know, and they don't realize there are things that you can do to actually help your body and help you, you know, go through it and actually still feel, you know, the benefits of the way you felt when you were younger, you know, you can, you can pull your body back a little bit and make it feel like it used to before you entered perimenopause, before you entered, you know, menopause, by the way, you treat your body and how you're eating and what you're doing to incorporate in your your lifestyle to change and to help improve, I think. Yeah. I was just talking to a woman today and um, she's, just like what you've talked, she's really frustrated that she's not losing weight and she can't work out anymore. She can't diet any harder. And she just needed someone to tell her like, this is not your fault. And let's pull back on the tight. Let's, let's rethink how you're moving and let's use a day like that. She's a busy, she's a busy mom and, uh, and she does a lot. She's juggling a lot. And we're going to use, a. A day or two where she would just be gritting, grinding it out to just do some self-care. And that like she needed permission for someone to share that or and it just there is some guilt and shame wrapped up in yeah. this. And um it's just 
uh, I just think there's more attention and uh, on the topic and helping women to understand it's really not you. Like yeah. I said, it's a full contact sport, and yeah. uh, and it's uh, there. There are some ways though um, that that you can balance it or just get a get a hold on on how you're feeling, but um, it's not easy. I think that's one of the biggest things that I hear from people is that they feel guilty of putting, giving themselves some self-care or self-love. They don't want to put themselves first. They feel like they have to put their pe the people around them first, but then they don't realize, I think, that in order to take care of others, you need to take care of yourself first. Yeah. It's like, what, what, what do they say in the airplane? You got to put your oxygen mask on first, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's a good point. That's a yeah. great point. Now, tell me a little about the different things that you're doing right now, because I know you mentioned that you have a course that you're working on that's going to be launching soon. And yeah. tell everybody all the different things that you have in store and some of the things you're doing now that you could have people come onto your website and, you know, utilize and, and services that you do to help people. Yeah. So I've got, if you look at foodandmoodlab.com, uh, everything's there where you can find me on social. And um, I've got a VIP program that makes it really affordable and simple for people to get in a community, to start learning about how, like what, what healthy means to them, how to adopt um, healthy lifestyle habits specific around nutrition and feeling good at really whatever phase of life you are. So it's a really simple way. And then I'll be launching a course uh, that people can get involved in along with a community and some one-on-one -on -one support for me, uh, from me, um, that's just focused on um, mastering your mood and uh, specifically like balancing hormones. So that'll be um, that'll be coming out soon. But if you people can subscribe, I blog all the time. I'm on social media and Instagram. I love to just um, I love to share information, and that's really what I originally set out to do is just to start to educate people right. and um, provide just to contribute to different publications and to my own blog. So um, it's real easy. If you just go to foodandmoodlab.com, you'll see a subscription button and how to work with me or how to connect on social. I think that's great. And I'm looking forward to seeing your new course coming out soon. Thank you. And you know, there's so many things, like, especially when you're going through um, menopause is your mood swings go all over the board and people don't even realize they just know that they feel different and they don't understand what's going on. And, you know, it's so important to find natural ways to stabilize your body, stabilize your mind, the way you feel, the way you think and, and feel good about yourself. So when you look in the mirror, you like who you see, you know, because yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's important. And I think the more I, I'm really big on um, using awareness and as education as really the main, like instead of like, there, that's a big part of my program, because I think when we feel educated, we get a little power back. Yes. And as, as we, as women, we, we try to figure out how to navigate this. And if we're approaching it with an open mind and curiosity, like I truly believe that this can be, we can be thriving through this phase. And um you know, I, I have a, a component of the course too, where we talk about how are we going to explain it to the people closest to us? So right. we can help people understand, Hey, here's how you can support me. Uh, exactly. and this is what I need. Um, at, at times, you know, when I'm feeling cranky, I, I'm not getting sleep. Like, you know, we're oftentimes, I know I fall victim to this. I expect my husband to understand my needs. Yeah. And he has no idea. I asked him the other day, like, what do you know about menopause? Yeah. But he's like, I think it's this thing that happens. And like when women are uh -huh. over 50, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I think he, and, and not, not, it's not his fault at all. Right. But right. we can't expect to get the support from my relatives or friends if I'm not sharing with them what I need and not right. in the moment when I need it, because it's not going to come through usually exactly. in the right, with the right delivery. So um, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but just you gotta, we also have to think about um, beyond just the food, like how are we, because um, it's all about community and support when, you know, and having the people closest around us, like understanding what our needs are and exactly. uh, yeah. So, and, and understanding it in a way that helps them um, just be there in a way that we need it. So. I love that because, you know, I think, I think men especially don't understand what we go through and under, if they understood it better, they could actually 
help us, you know, and yes. you know, because I, I think, you know, I had a friend, you know, she was going through menopause and her husband had no clue, you know, he knew she was going through menopause, but he had no clue. He would just say, make sure she has another, a little extra wine tonight. She's a little bit moody, you know? And it was like, <laughs> that was his uh, solution. I'd be like, OMG. I'm like, you know, it's just, yeah. you know, they don't get it. They don't get it. And I think that's great that you're bringing awareness. That's a wonderful thing because once they understand, they'll be able to help the person they love, you know, cope with it. And they could be a support system instead of being on the opposite end. Yeah. We don't need to suffer. We do not yeah. need to suffer through perimenopause or menopause, we, we, but we do have to be strong women, not just strong physically, but we have to be strong in our minds and uh, yeah. get ourselves educated and then understand, well, how do I really put all, how do I put these ideas into action in my life when, you know, I'm working or I have kids, I'm barely at home. I mean, that's a struggle, yeah. I mean, just a mm -hmm. practical struggle. And I think it's so important because if we stabilize our hormones and we're able to actually, you know, go through it and, and have less symptoms, you know, we don't have to rush our bodies into post-menopause, you know, by taking care of your body, you could actually stay in menopause with less symptoms and be able to not experience the feelings of getting older and slowing down. So I think it's yeah. really important, the things that you're doing, I think it's really beneficial that people learn these Thank things. You. Yeah, I'm super, uh, very passionate about it. So before we leave, tell everybody where they can find you. So they remember the website and I'll put everything in the, uh, in the description also. That, so just go to foodandmoodlab.com and you'll see everything there that I mentioned. If you're a Facebooker, it's a Food and Mood Lab page. Uh, it's a really great community out there, especially on Instagram too. That's a keep it real with Amy. Um, but any of those resources, uh, you'll get directed to the webpage and find me out there. That's great. Thank you so much, Amy, for being on the show today. You've given us a whirlwind of information and such valuable information. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Thanks again, Stacey. Oh, you're welcome. You have a great day. You too.